This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by J. A. Carter Orthodoxy by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 2 The Maniac Part 1 Thoroughly worldly people never understand even the world. They rely altogether on a few cynical maxims which are not true. Once I remember walking with a prosperous publisher, who made a remark which I had often heard before. It is indeed almost a motto of the modern world, yet I had heard it once too often, and I saw suddenly that there was nothing in it. The publisher said of somebody, That man will get on. He believes in himself. And I remember that as I lifted my head to listen, my eye caught an omnibus on which was written, Hanwell. I said to him, Shall I tell you where the men are who believe most in themselves? For I can tell you. I know of men who believe in themselves more colossally than Napoleon or Caesar. I know where flames the fixed star of certainty and success. I can guide you to the thrones of the supermen. The men who really believe in themselves are all in lunatic asylums. He said mildly that there were a good many men, after all, who believed in themselves and who were not in lunatic asylums. Yes, there are, I retorted, and you of all men ought to know them. That drunken poet, from whom you would not take a dreary tragedy, he believed in himself. That elderly minister, with an epic from whom you were hiding in a back room, he believed in himself. If you consulted your business experience instead of your ugly individualistic philosophy, you would know that believing in himself is one of the commonest signs of a rotter. Actors who can't act believe in themselves, and debtors who won't pay. It would be much truer to say that a man will certainly fail because he believes in himself. Complete self-confidence is not merely a sin. Complete self-confidence is a weakness. Believing utterly in oneself is a hysterical and superstitious belief, like believing in Joanna Southcote. The man who has it has Hanwell written on his face, as plain as it is written on that omnibus. And to all this, my friend, the publisher, made this very deep and effective reply. Well, if a man is not to believe in himself, in what is he to believe? After a long pause, I replied, I will go home and write a book in answer to that question. This is the book that I have written in answer to it. But I think this book may well start where our argument started, in the neighborhood of the madhouse. Modern masters of science are much impressed with the need of beginning all inquiry with a fact. The ancient masters of religion were quite equally impressed with that necessity. They began with the fact of sin, a fact as practical as potatoes. Whether or no man could be washed in miraculous waters, there was no doubt at any rate that he wanted washing. But certain religious leaders in London, not mere materialists, have begun in our day not to deny the highly disputable water, but to deny the indisputable dirt. Certain new theologians dispute original sin, which is the only part of Christian theology which can really be proved. Some followers of the Reverend R. J. Campbell, in their almost too fastidious spirituality, admit divine sinlessness, which they cannot see even in their dreams, but they essentially deny human sin, which they can see in the street. The strongest saints and the strongest skeptics alike took positive evil as the starting point of their argument. If it be true, as it certainly is, that a man can feel exquisite happiness in skinning a cat, then the religious philosopher can only draw one of two conclusions. He must either deny the existence of God, as all atheists do, or he must deny the present union between God and man, as all Christians do. The new theologians seem to think it a highly rationalistic solution to deny the cat. In this remarkable situation, it is plainly not now possible, with any hope of universal appeal, to start, as our fathers did, with the fact of sin. This very fact which was to them, and is to me, as plain as a pike staff, is the very fact that has been specially deluded or denied. But though moderns deny the existence of sin, I do not think that they have yet denied the existence of a lunatic asylum. We all agree still that there is a collapse of the intellect as unmistakable as a falling house. Men deny hell, but not as yet Hanwell. For the purpose of our primary argument, the one may very well stand where the other stood. 
I mean that as all thoughts and theories were once judged by whether they tended to make a man lose his soul, so for our present purpose all modern thoughts and theories may be judged by whether they tend to make a man lose his wits. It is true that some speak lightly and loosely of insanity as in itself attractive, but a moment's thought will show that if disease is beautiful, it is generally someone else's disease. A blind man may be picturesque, but it requires two eyes to see the picture. And similarly, even the wildest poetry of insanity can only be enjoyed by the sane. To the insane man, his insanity is quite prosaic, because it is quite true. A man who thinks himself a chicken is to himself as ordinary as a chicken. A man who thinks he is a bit of glass is to himself as dull as a bit of glass. It is the homogeneity of his mind which makes him dull, and which makes him mad. It is only because we see the irony of his idea that we think him even amusing. It is only because he does not see the irony of his idea that he is put in Hanwell at all. In short, oddities only strike ordinary people. Oddities do not strike odd people. This is why ordinary people have a much more exciting time, while odd people are always complaining of the dullness of life. This is also why the new novels die so quickly, and why the old fairy tales endure forever. The old fairy tale makes the hero a normal human boy. It is his adventures that are startling. They startle him because he is normal. But in the modern psychological novel, the hero is abnormal. The center is not central. Hence, the fiercest adventures fail to affect him adequately, and the book is monotonous. You can make a story out of a hero among dragons, but not out of a dragon among dragons. The fairy tale discusses what a sane man will do in a mad world. The sober, realistic novel of today discusses what an essential lunatic will do in a dull world. Let us begin, then, with the madhouse. From this evil and fantastic inn, let us set forth on our intellectual journey. Now, if we are to glance at the philosophy of sanity, the first thing to do in the matter is to blot out one big and common mistake. There is a notion adrift everywhere that imagination, especially mystical imagination, is dangerous to men's mental balance. Poets are commonly spoken of as psychologically unreliable, and generally there is a vague association between wreathing laurels in your hair and sticking straws in it. Facts and history utterly contradict this view. Most of the very great poets have been not only sane, but extremely businesslike. And if Shakespeare ever really held horses, it was because he was much the safest man to hold them. Imagination does not breed insanity. Exactly what does breed insanity is reason. Poets do not go mad, but chess players do. Mathematicians go mad, and cashiers, but creative artists very seldom. I am not, as will be seen, in any sense attacking logic. I only say that this danger does seem to lie in logic, and not in imagination. Artistic paternity is as wholesome as physical paternity. Moreover, it is worthy of remark that when a poet really was morbid, it was commonly because he had some weak spot of rationality on his brain. Poe, for instance, really was morbid, not because he was poetical, but because he was specially analytical. Even chess was too poetical for him. He disliked chess because it was full of knights and castles, like a poem. He avowedly preferred the black discs of draughts because they were more like the mere black dots on a diagram. Perhaps the strongest case of all is this, that only one great English poet went mad, Cowper. And he was definitely driven mad by logic, by the ugly and alien logic of predestination. Poetry was not the disease, but the medicine. Poetry partly kept him in health. He could sometimes forget the red and thirsty hell to which his hideous necessitarianism dragged him among the wide waters and the white flat lilies of the ooze. He was damned by John Calvin. He was almost saved by John Gilpin. Everywhere we see that men do not go mad by dreaming. Critics are much madder than poets. Homer is complete and calm enough. It is his critics who tear him into extravagant tatters. Shakespeare is quite himself. It is only some of his critics who have discovered that he was somebody else. And though St. John the Evangelist saw many strange monsters in his vision, he saw no creature so wild as one of his own commentators. The general fact is simple. Poetry is sane because it floats easily in an infinite sea. Reason seeks to cross the infinite sea and so make it finite. The result is mental exhaustion, like the physical exhaustion of Mr. Holbein. 
To accept everything is an exercise, to understand everything a strain. The poet only desires exaltation and expansion, a world to stretch himself in. The poet only asks to get his head into the heavens. It is the logician who seeks to get the heavens into his head, and it is his head that splits. It is a small matter, but not irrelevant, that this striking mistake is commonly supported by a striking misquotation. We have all heard people cite the celebrated line of Dryden as, Great genius is to madness near allied. But Dryden did not say that great genius was to madness near allied. Dryden was a great genius himself, and knew better. It would have been hard to find a man more romantic than he, or more sensible. 